All right, today we're going to talk about some of the first dynasties of China. And from the slide, you can see the first dynasty, and in parentheses, kinda. I'm going to explain that in just a little bit. But uh, China's history is full of something called dynasties. And let's talk about what a dynasty is first. Now, we have discussed it before, but it doesn't hurt to review it a little bit. A dynasty is a bunch of rulers who belong to the same family over many generations. They rule over the same area, and it's kept within the bloodline. And if someone, say, you get to a dynasty and the ruler in this dynasty dies and there's no one in the bloodline to take over, that dynasty ends right there. And then whoever takes over outside of the bloodline, their dynasty begins. Another way dynasties can end also is by rebellion. If, if the people rebel against the ruler of this dynasty and someone outside the family takes control, then that's the end of the dynasty and a new dynasty um, begins. So that's how dynasties are, and there's a lot of that in China, and you'll hear a lot about that through this unit um, of ancient China about dynasties and things like that. Now, why kind of the first dynasty? Well, up until recently, there, archaeologists and historians believed there was a certain dynasty that was the very first one, but they found evidence that that wasn't true, and there was actually a dynasty before that. And this dynasty um, was called the Shia dynasty. Now, they don't know a whole lot about that dynasty, and they're still gathering information, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because we don't know a lot about it. Um, and then we'll move on to the one that was for a long time thought to be the first dynasty. So let's get on to the Shia dynasty. And um, they believe that around 2000 BC, farms along the Huanghu River, which you will probably like to call it the Yellow River, were uh, growing larger and being pretty productive, kind of like how the people along the Nile, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Indus, and all that stuff, they were settling near rivers because of the water, of course, and the silt and the fertile soil that would help them grow food so they didn't have to move around all over the place. They could stay in one spot and be able to survive. And this was true in China along the Huanghu River. Now, these towns started growing. And the largest ones became capitals of states, and little states started to form in China around this area, kind of, kind of like what states that we know of today, but a little bit different. Now, according to legend, uh, the first Chinese dynasty, the Xia dynasty, emerged around 2000 BC, about 4,000 years ago. And the leader of this dynasty was named Yu. Not you, the pronoun. I'm not, I'm not talking about you who's listening. I'm talking about the Chinese guy named you. Not you. But I am talking about you. But not you as you. Never mind. You understand. The guy in the picture, you. Um, but he, this guy was an engineer and a mathematician. And the reason why he was successful is because along this river, the Huanghu River, or the Yellow River, I know, I know, Flooding was unpredictable, and we had talked about how flooding had helped all those other civilizations that we've talked about before, but sometimes it can be unpredictable, and that's not good because if you plant your crops along the river, and then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, during the planting season, it floods, you've lost all of your food, and if you lose all your food, you can't eat, and that can really, really be harmful to a civilization. So the people along the Huanghu River were dealing with this. And Hugh was brilliant and came up with a plan to help out these farmers so that they wouldn't have to worry about their fields flooding and not eating and things like that. So he came up with a flood control and irrigation projects that helped tame the Yellow River so that these settlements could grow. When they tamed the Yellow River, the flooding was not unexpected anymore. They could bring water to the fields instead of carrying it like we talked about before with irrigation and because of that then the farmers started to be more and more successful and more and more food was starting to grow and we talked about before is the more food you have the more people you can support so population starts to grow now here's the thing that's very interesting about this is remember the Chinese people were isolated from the rest of the world during this time so they had not seen the irrigation systems of the Mesopotamians or the 
Egyptians or even their closest neighbor, the Harappans. They had not seen any of that. So you came up with this on his own without knowing that it was going on in other places in the world, which is pretty amazing. So they were doing the same things as those other civilizations, but had no idea that those civilizations even existed. Now, like I said, we don't know much about this dynasty, but um, the one that came after it, the one that was considered to be the first one until recently, about 1600 BC, the kingdom that we we're going to start talking about um, went over a, a large part of the Huanghe River Delta and kind of took over what the Shia had controlled at one point. Now, when they took over, one of the earliest capital, capitals was a city called Shang, and they named it after one of the first rulers, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. And from then on, that's what that state's name was. And then as that state got bigger and turned into a dynasty that lasted, by the way, about 600 years, it was known as the Shang Dynasty. And it would shape the lives of the people along that river in China and the rest of the world for a long time. Now, the guy who started that, he, he was a rebel leader. He didn't like the way that the Shia was, was doing all of their things, and he kind of read, led a rebellion and removed the last Shia emperor from power and took over for himself. And this guy's name was Tang of Shang. And no, he did not develop the disgusting orange drink that they use in the space shuttle. If you've ever had Tang, you know how gross it is. If you've never had it, don't ever use it. Don't ever, don't even drink it at all. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's like orange, not even close to orange flavored water. It's just disgusting. Kind of gritty too. Ugh, it's gross. But we don't have this guy to blame for that. This guy did great things. Invention of Tang, not so great. Okay, he probably would be embarrassed that he's so would be associated and share the same name as that gross drink. Anyway, on to other things. Um, now this state spread acro across the Huang Hu River until it ruled hundreds and hundreds of towns, and the Shang kings actually created new towns by giving land to their relatives or nobles. And these towns were very important. They were centers of production. They supplied food, clothing, and other products for the kings and the nobles. And the nobles are the, kind of the wealthy uh, upper class of a society. And um, these towns also helped from enemy states from invading the huge Shang lands at this point. Because the people were also part-time soldiers. So that kind of helped as well. So not only did they do whatever they needed to do, whether it was farming or making products and things like that, they were part-time soldiers as well. Now, near the end of the Shang Dynasty's 600-year rule, the capital was moved to a city called Yinzhu. And its new site was near a town that is now today called Anyang, modern-day city of Anyang. This was the start of the golden age of early Chinese culture, crafts, and science of the Shang Dynasty, which we will talk about soon enough. Now, the best evidence of this was a royal tomb that was from the Shang Dynasty that have really given archaeologists an idea of how great their craftsmanship and their industry and their architecture of their tombs and palaces and things like that. And some of that architecture that you can see today in modern China, China um, was influenced by the Shang. And the tomb that they found was the tomb of a queen. Her name was Fu Hao. And you're going to love the name of her husband when we talk about him in just a, just a bit. But in her tomb, they found evidence of all of these things. And they also found some written record, some of the earliest written Chinese record in that tomb, which was written down in a strange, strange way. Now, these written records in the tomb of Fu Hao, and by the way, her husband's name was Wu Ding, gotta love it um, they were on something called oracle bones and what oracle bones were is they were made from either turtle shells or shoulder blades of cattle and they had written things down early Chinese characters on these oracle bones and they believed that these oracle bones could be used to tell the future you give it to a special priest 
and what they would do is they would have you write this whatever you wanted to know about on the this oracle bone the priests would then heat the oracle bones over a fire until they cracked and if they cracked a certain way that's how they were able to answer questions about the future if they cracked a certain way then it was an answer to this question if it cracked another way it was another answer i don't know how they came up with that i don't know how cracks have to do that have what to do with do with all of that but that's what they believed now the kings the shang kings really relied on this for some reason especially like wu ding like i said fu hao's husband wu ding depended on those priests to read those oracle bones to predict the future he would answer he would ask questions like would fu hao recover from an illness evidently she didn't would farmers have a good harvest that year should wu ding go to war with a rival state things like that were used to where questions that were asked of these oracle bones and they relied on those heavily to make those decisions which seems kind of strange to us but that's kind of what they believed now later on we'll talk a little bit more uh and go a little bit more in depth of, of some of their beliefs and we'll talk about something like the mandate of heaven and their religion which really wasn't a religion and it had more to do with their ancestors and such um, as we go on it's not so much religion, but a way of thinking. It's going to be a little different, but you'll understand when we get there, and we'll talk about that next time.